Nathan Massatelli. I'm a senior software developer uh, and team lead at Geotab, and today I'm going to go over some tips and tricks uh, in integrating with my Geotab. So what exactly does that mean, integrating with my Geotab? Uh, when we talk about this, we usually mean taking data that exists in my Geotab and using it in either new or existing applications that you already have in order to best fulfill your customers' needs. Uh, my Geotab is a great application. It does a, a ton of good and powerful things, but we cannot build a tool that is all things to all people. So what we've done instead is we've built out a set of public APIs that uh, give you access to everything that my Geotab has. Okay, And I, I can't emphasize this enough. There is no secret sauce in my Geotab. Everything that we do and we have access to, you also have access to those exact same APIs. So the first piece of this is authentication. We want to make sure that you are, are accessing data that you are supposed to access and that you are allowed to access. My Geotab supports two uh, types of authentication, basic and SAML. Basic authentication is your standard username and password. So you provide a username and a password, and we give you back a session. Now this is the first tip I'm going to have, is make sure you use that session for all subsequent API calls. We see some customers uh, provide their password over and over and over again for all API calls. And since we don't store those directly, we need to hash what you provide in order to check that it matches. And that hashing algorithm is expensive. And this is going to slow down your APIs. It's going to cause you to hit rate limits. And you're going to have a bunch of problems if you do this. So make sure that you use that session. Our C Sharp and JavaScript wrappers, I'm going to talk about them a bunch today, but they take care of all of this for you. So you, when you construct the C Sharp wrapper, you will provide a username and password. And behind the scenes, it will do the authentication. It will handle session reuse. It will handle session expiry. So you don't have to think about it at all. If you are going to store this session, please make sure that you store it securely. Until the session expires, it's as good as having a password. So don't write it to a file somewhere on a laptop or anything like that. Please store it securely. So SAML is the next type of authentication that we support. And this is an implementation of single sign-on. And what that is, is it means if we have a customer system over here and my Geotab over here, the customer is going to log into their system, and that system is then going to vouch for them to my Geotab. So they're going to get access to my Geotab, even though that my Geotab knows nothing about their password or anything like that. Now, this is important for a couple of reasons. The first is that it reduces your attack surface, OK? If there's ever an issue with my Geotab, you don't have to worry about user passwords or th that kind of data being leaked because it's simply not in that system. It's in your system that you've set up and is, is operating at your um, specific level of, of security. The other thing that it does is it simplifies user management, both for the end user and for the organization. If I'm an end user, I don't have to remember multiple passwords. I remember one password, I get into that system, and then I can get into my Geotab or whatever else I need to do. If I'm managing a set of users and I need to force a password reset or I need to deny someone access, again, there's one spot where I need to do that. I don't have to worry about going into 10 different systems and locking someone out or forcing a password reset. So the way SAML works is with public and private keys and XML. So you will generate, your organization will generate a public and private key, and they will keep the private key, but they will give the public key to my Geotab. And this is fine. The name public key means it can be handed out and given to anybody. And all the public key does is it verifies uh, the signature that will be given to a set of XML. So you'll log into this customer application over here. That application will generate some XML that says it's for you know, Nathan Massatelli, and they will sign it and send that to my Geotab. My Geotab will check that signature, say, I have a user here named Nathan Massatelli. The signature checks out, so I will let you in. And it will either return a session, just like a normal Authenticate call, or it can return a 302 redirect. So the user will just kind of be redirected and be in my Geotab. So here's just a, a little diagram to explain this a little again. So a user will log into the customer application, which contains the private key. That customer application can sign some XML and send it to my Geotab. My Geotab will verify that signature with the public key and return either a session or a 302 redirect. So this is, might be a little bit hard to see, but this is what the XML of that SAML response actually looks like. And there's a couple important points. The first is the issuer. That will need to match whatever is on the public key that my Geotab has. The second is there's going to be a set of conditions on here that will say how long that this XML is valid for. So you don't have to worry about someone capturing some XML and then sending it again later to get access when they shouldn't. It's only going to be valid for a certain amount of time. 
At the bottom or near the bottom, you'll see that there's an attribute called email, and that's how we identify the MyGeotab user that's going to be logging in. And at the very bottom, which might be a little bit hard to see, but it's just a, the signature and it's just a big blob of text. But that is what we're going to use to verify that this XML has not been tampered with and it's come from the correct source. So I'm going to do a quick demo of this. And what I've done is I'm logged into my Geotab as myself, okay, as Nathan Massatelli. And I want to just say that before we go forward, uh, the UI that I'm about to show you is still in demo or in beta. So if you want to see it, you actually have to enable your feature preview. Okay, so go into options and enable feature preview in order to see this. But once you've done that, you can come into system settings and you'll see that there's a tab here called certificates. And I've already uploaded a certificate, but this is what it would look like. You would generate a certificate and if you wanted to add a new one, you would simply put the issue in here and then upload the file. And that's all it takes to get a key into my Geotab. And once you've done that, you can come over to users. And I've got two users here. I've got myself and I've got Sam L. And you'll see that Sam has all the normal stuff you would expect, username, first name, last name, but it has no password. There's no password here. Instead, all we've done is we've said this user is linked to this certificate. You can have one certificate for your entire organization. You can have one certificate for each user. That's up to you. But we've just said that this user can log in only when they are verified. Uh, we've had some verified XML, and it's verified with this certificate. So if I come into this little demo app that I've written, this is just a stock standard ASP.NET app, and I log in as Sam L. Okay, so I'm in this app and I have a button here called go to my Geotab. And when I click this, the app is going to generate that XML, sign it, send it to my Geotab, and I'm going to be redirected into my Geotab. And you can see now I'm into the database. I'm in as Sam L. And this operates exactly as, as it would for anybody else. And when I'm done here, I can actually log out and I'm redirected back into the customer application. So we've seen people build uh, a kind of seamless experience where they have a little application that's really just a web browser, and as they're in there and they're clicking buttons and stuff, they can get into my Geotab and out of my Geotab seamlessly. So that's just a quick overview of SAML. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the data feeds. So the data feeds are a set of public APIs that are designed to get large amounts of data out of my Geotab as quickly as possible. We want to make that data available to be consumed by you as soon as it's available to my Geotab. So this is a poll-based API. You'll make a call, you'll get some data back, and then you'll also get a token. And the next time you call, you're going to provide that token back to us, and we will give you everything that has come in since the last time you called. Now, one important point that we've seen people trip up with is the data is not guaranteed to arrive to you in chronological order, because it's not guaranteed to arrive to my Geotab in chronological order. When the device sends the data, there may be network delays, there may be servers down, there might be some kind of slowdown, and so the data may get into my Geotab at different times, which makes it available to you at different times. This isn't necessarily uh, a big deal, but your application just needs to be able to handle it, and we've seen people run into issues where they write stuff that expects stuff to be in chronological order. So there's two kinds of data you can get through my Geotab, or through the data feed. Active data and calculated data. Active data, I like to think of it as raw data. This is measurements from the Go device that are sent to my Geotab, and once they arrive, they're it. that's it. Speeds, GPS position, engine readings, once uh, it's reported and saved, that's it. That data does not change ever. Calculated data, on the other hand, is data that is derived from active data, and so it will change as we get new active data. So trips and exception events are the primary uh, Ex examples of this. And if we consider trips, what we will do is we will get GPS data and we will say, okay, a vehicle has started moving and we will create a new trip. Trips have a start date and a stop date. And initially the start and stop date will be basically the same. But as we get more data that shows that the vehicle is still moving, we will bump out that stop date. And so what Geotab does is it will create that trip with the start and stop date at the same time and it will save that into the database. You guys can then pull that out and you'll get a trip. Later on, we will go, OK, we now have a new trip that is for the same vehicle, and it starts at the same time, but the stop time is different. We will delete the trip that was there before and write in this new trip. And you will again get this new trip available on the feed. It's up to you to match up trips for the same vehicle and the same start time. That is a unique combination of properties. A single vehicle cannot have two trips that start at the same time. So if you see that happen, you know that a trip has been replaced, and you need to update your logic accordingly. Exception events work 
pretty much the exact same way. The exception events have a start and an end time, and as we get more data, they will, the end time will be extended outwards. They're a little bit easier to deal with because exception events are actually updated in the database. So you will get an exception event with an ID of one and a version of one. And then later on, you will get another exception event with an ID of one, but this time the version will be two. And you can know that you need to replace it. Sometimes we do delete exception events. If we ever have an exception event that is this long and we get some additional data that says, no, you should actually have two events, one here and one here with a gap in the middle, we have to delete that existing one. So again, you need to look for a unique combination of properties. For exception events, it's going to be device ID, rule ID, and start time. A single vehicle cannot have two exception events that start at the same time for the same rule. Doesn't really make any sense. So that's all I had to say about the data feed. Are there any questions, by the way? I'm, I feel like I'm blowing by this. Uh, OK. Uh, the not, next thing we're going to talk about is JSON RPC. So uh, we have these wrappers that we make available for use by either C Sharp or JavaScript to interact with our API. But there's an underlying spec in order to interact with our API called JSON RPC. And we have uh, some customers that, for one reason or another, cannot use our wrappers. They, they can't interop. They don't want to use it. So they need to fall back and use this JSON RPC spec. And we've seen some people hit some problems. So I just kind of want to quickly walk through what a call and how to construct a call for JSON RPC. So this is to access the API over HTTPS using get and post methods. I'm going to go over post today. HTTPS is required with a minimum TLS version of 1.2. Okay? Uh, the post request and response are going to follow the standard JSON RPC spec, which I'm going to go over here. But if you want some more information, uh, you can uh, please take a look at, honestly, Wikipedia has a great uh, overview of what this uh, spec looks like. The URL you're going to be posting to is HTTPS and then a server slash API v1. That server is going to be given back to you during authentication. So when you authenticate, you're going to get back that token that I mentioned earlier. And you're also going to get back a specific server that you're going to talk to. My3, My88, My402, whatever. Uh, Peter did mention in one of the earlier sessions, but we are working to hide everything behind uh, a single URL. So it will just be in future my.geotel.com slash API v1. But that is coming. So you now need to have your post body. So the post body for JSON RPC is going to be a JSON object. And the minimum uh, amount that you can have in here is a single property called method. That method is going to be a string, and it's going to be the name of the method that you're going to call. All of these uh, methods and their parameters are going to be found on the SDK docs at my.geotub.com slash SDK, or now available on GitHub. And so if we go and just take a look at what my.geotab.com slash SDK looks like, here's a couple methods that are documented. We have get coordinates and we have get count of. If we focus in on get count of, you can see that there are, uh, it returns a number, the number of an entity in a database. And there's two parameters, credentials, which is an object, and type name, which is a string. So if I want to get the count of devices, my JSON object is going to look like this. The method get count of, and then there was a params object with a type name and credentials. Type name is just a string device. And the credentials object, if I follow in the SDK, I'm going to see that the credentials has the following properties, database, password, session ID, and username. Okay? Uh, these properties uh, let's, are, are all strings, so that's straightforward. Let's pretend that I have uh, already logged in and I have a session ID. So I'm just going to provide a username and a session ID. So the JSON uh, RPC post body would look like this. And, um, that's it. So I'm basically ready to go. At this point, I just need to uh, URL encode that JSON, set the content type appropriately, and the form key is going to be JSON RPC. Now, when I get a response back, 99% uh, of the time, you're going to get a 200 response. Because the JSON RPC spec says that we should be returning something to you even if there was an error. So you will get a JSON object back even if there is an error. If there is a successful result, you'll get a JSON uh, object back that has a single property called result. And the property value will be the value of the method call. So for get count of, it's just going to be a number, in this case 1607. But if I was actually getting all of the devices, there would be an array of those device objects. If I get an error, uh, you will have a JSON object again with a single property, this time called error. And that error will have a minimum of two properties, name and message. And they're going to give you an idea about what the issue was. So in this particular case, there was a, an issue with my login credentials. Perhaps my session's expired or something like that. And uh, I need to re-authenticate. But that's a typical error that you might get. So I've mentioned that we have these API wrappers in C Sharp and JavaScript, and they hide all of this from you. So if you can, I very much suggest that you use these API wrappers. 
Uh, they are officially supported and we use them internally, so they're, they're pretty well battle tested. There are a number of unofficial wrappers. There's a bunch on GitHub. If you just search for Geotab, you'll see a couple of different things. Python, Ruby, Node, and Google Sheets. Uh, I think the Python one is actually someone at Geotab did, although I'm not 100% sure if it's officially supported yet. But you can go and take a look, see if they're right for you. Uh, most of them work pretty well from my experience. So just a couple references, uh, and then we'll do some questions if anybody has anything. Uh, the API documentation, my.geotab.com slash SDK, or if you go onto uh, GitHub, you can just search for Geotab, and all of that is now there. Uh, there is method and object documentation, so everything and every object that you can interact with is available there. There is a runner where you can try things out, play around with the API, get a feel for it. There are a ton of examples, everything from adding a vehicle to getting the current location, getting fuel level, sending text messages, everything you can think of, and of course, the official C Sharp and JavaScript wrappers. Uh, and then here are some links. These slides are supposed to be available. So here are some links to all of the um, Geotab uh, and the unofficial API wrappers that we have uh, available to everybody. So that is kind of everything that I wanted to just go over with. And now I just thought we'd open it up to some general questions. I feel like that would be the best uh, way to maybe help you guys out with your, uh, with your integrations. I don't know if this link is working, or uh, is it up and running, or is anybody using it? Or? OK. Does anybody uh, have any questions? Anything they want to ask? Right here. Yeah, so we've been doing some integrations with, uh, or helping with some integrations with a few resellers. So we've been, is this on? OK. OK. So we've been doing some uh, integrations with a few other resellers um, and helping them out. And uh, we got a question about uh, common errors and an error list. Now, I know on the old SDK, mm. there was no published common errors. I was wondering if the new one has it yet. That is a, uh, so the question, okay, so just to, uh, for recording, uh, they want to know if there's a list of common errors. We have gotten that uh, feedback from a lot of people using our API, and we are busy compiling that. Um, we have, are in the process of tweaking the error messages that we get to get a set standard uh, set of output, and also um, we're cleaning up what we uh, send out so you, don't, you won't be getting stack traces or anything uh, interesting like that anymore. So you'll, we, it's coming. Anybody else? Any, anything on SAML, authentication, the data feeds? Sure, yeah. It looked like the authentication, or rather the credentials parameter, mm. um, you only ever send the password or the session. Yes. So um, you're expecting your session to expire? It's not like a token that never expires? No, so the session will expire. We, we generate it, and on the server, that's, the session is, is, doesn't have any real information in, in it, but on the server, we say that it's only valid for a certain amount of time. So eventually, as you keep supplying the session, you will get rejected, and you'll need to re-authenticate. And, and yep. just to follow up, like roughly, is that... Is that like every hour, or is it a couple no, days? No, no, no. It's it's or? it's days. It's it's a few days. Yeah, okay. it's a few days. Okay, unless cool. unless someone logs out or expires a session uh, in that way, but otherwise it's a couple of days. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Hey, uh, we're a new partner, and we're looking at an, an integration. But when you described the single sign-on, it mm -hmm. seemed like you're saying they're signing on on the customer site, and that's going to automatically log them in in my GeoTab. We were looking to do the opposite log in at MyGeotab and have them authenticate on our site automatically. Can you describe that? So what you, I mean, what you would need to do is, I guess, provide the uh, set. So you would authenticate with MyGeotab, and you would get a valid MyGeotab session back. Mm -hmm. They would provide that to your uh, application, and your application would then need to just try out and test that call. Like, so make a call to my Geotab and ver verify that that session is still valid. So any, any call, like a get count of anything, if it returns successfully, then they, they would be authenticated. OK, thank That's you. Anything else? Anything else? It's very hot up here, so I don't mind stopping if it's. <laughs> thank you very much, everybody, for listening.